In today's video, I'm gonna do a walkthrough of the math and no calculator section from the April 2021 SAT. I've scored perfectly on back-to-back -back SAT math sections, and as I go through these problems, I'm gonna show you the most efficient way to answer each and every one. So with all that being said, make sure to like and subscribe, and let's go ahead and get started with question number one. So which expression is equivalent to 12x cubed divided by 8x squared, where x is not equal to one? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and do 12 over eight. I know that 12 over eight can simplify down to three over two. Next thing, x cubed divided by x squared just means that we're subtracting subtracting our exponents. So that's going to be x to the power of 3 minus 2, which we know will leave us with just x. So we're going to have 3x over 2, which will be answer choice B. All right, moving on to number 2. So we've got a graph. It says the graph of a linear equation and the graph of a quadratic equation are shown. What is true about the point negative 1 and 4? What we see at the point negative 1 and 4, those two graphs are intersecting. And because those two graphs are intersecting there, that point is going to satisfy both of these equations. It's not only going to satisfy one, it'll satisfy both of them since they're intersecting at that point. All right, moving on to number three now. So we have a ball is thrown upward from a height of three feet above the ground. Assuming no air resistance, the function h defined by h of t is equal to negative 16 squared plus 36t plus 3 models the ball's height h of t and feet above the ground t seconds after it's thrown. Based on the model, what is the meaning of h of 2 equals 11 in the context? Well, that 2 is going to be representative of time in seconds. So that's going to mean that after two seconds of that ball being thrown up in the air, it's 11 feet in the air. Okay, so if we look at our answer choices, we have option A, the ball hits the ground two seconds after it's thrown. That's incorrect. Option B, the ball hits the ground 11 seconds after it's thrown. That's also incorrect. It's not hitting the ground yet. It's 11 feet in the air or 11 feet above the ground two seconds after it's thrown. So our answer there is going to be C. Option D says that it's two feet above the ground. That's incorrect. Two seconds has passed and it's 11 feet above the ground. All right, moving on to number four, which expression is equivalent to 4x squared plus 5x to the 4th minus 2x to the 5th plus 3x to the 4th. Well, let's go ahead and take our like terms. So we're going to have 4x to the 5th minus that 2x to the 5th. So that's going to end up leaving us with 2x to the 5th. So 2x to the 5th. We can go ahead and get rid of c and d then. Next up, our next like terms are going to be 5x to the 4th minus 3x to the 4th, which is once again going to leave us with a positive 2x to the 4th. So 2x to the 4th power. So our answer there is going to be answer choice B. All right, moving on to number five now. Number five. So we've got at sea level, the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. For every 500 foot increase in elevation above sea level, the boiling point of water decreases by about one degree Fahrenheit. Which equation models water's boiling point in F or in degrees Fahrenheit in terms of X, L, the elevation and feet above sea level? All right, well, we know that we're going to decrease our boiling point as we go higher above sea level. So we need to have a negative slope. We see that option C and D have positive slopes, so they're going to be incorrect. Next thing with A and B, we see that they both have that positive 212 as their intercept, okay, which is obviously going to be correct since water is uh, has a boiling point of 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. Now, keep in mind that it's for every 500 foot increase in elevation above sea level that we're decreasing by one degree Fahrenheit. So that's not going to be negative 500x. Negative 500x would mean that we're going down by 500 degrees Fahrenheit for every one foot that we go above sea level. And that's not true. For every 500 feet that we go above sea level, that's when we get that, that drop of one degree Fahrenheit in our boiling point. So our answer there is going to be A. Moving on to number six, we have a line that uh, says that the line shows the line shown models the possible combination of the number of goats and horses on a certain 10 acre farm can sustain based on the number of acres of land each animal needs. Based on this model, how many acres of land on the farm does each horse need? Well, we see that the most the maximum number of horses that we can have on this 10 acre farm is five. So if the most horses that we can have is five horses on a 10 acre farm, on a 10 acre farm, well, that's going to tell us then that each horse requires two acres. So our answer there is going to be A. Okay. So each horse requires two acres since we can only have a maximum of five horses on that 10 acres of land. All right, moving on to number seven. Which of the following ordered pairs X, Y satisfies the inequality above? Well, we see that y has to be less than x minus 4. Well, that means that x has to be more than 4 greater than y. It has to be more than 4 greater than y. More than 4 greater than y. Now, from this fact, we can go ahead and answer this question super quickly. Okay, since we know x has to be more than 4 greater than y, all we got to do is find the answer choice where our x is more than 4 greater than y. And that's a d. That's the only answer choice where that occurs. Okay, and you can always check this as well by plugging your y's and your x's in from your answer choices into this original problem, making sure that it works. As you can see, if we were to plug 6 in 4x, we'd have 6 minus 4. Is 6 minus 4 greater than 0? We see that it is. 
All right, so moving on to number eight now. In the right triangle PQR, the length of side PQ is 70. The measure of angle P is 90 degrees and the measure of angle R is 38 degrees. Which of the following represents the side length QR? Well, let's go ahead and draw out this triangle. So we're gonna have P, Q, and R. Now we know that angle P is gonna be our 90 degree angle. So we're gonna go ahead and put P right there. That's gonna be our 90 degree angle. And we see that we go from P to Q and then to R. All right, so we know that angle R is 38 degrees. So go ahead and mark that down. And then the next thing that we know is the side length PQ is 70. From here, we want to identify that hypotenuse, right? That length of QR. So to solve for QR, we can go ahead and write this by using the sine. We know that the sine is our opposite side length over our hypotenuse. So our opposite side length is going to be the 70 because that's the only side length we know right now. So we have to use 70 as our opposite side length. So we'll have 70 over our hypotenuse, which we know is QR. So 70 over QR has to equal then the sine of 38 degrees, the sine of 38 degrees, because we see the opposite side length to that 38 degrees is that 70. From here, all we gotta do is go ahead and solve for QR. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and just continue. I'm not gonna erase my triangle for more room. I'll just do it from over here. So we're gonna have to multiply each side by QR, multiply each side by QR, and we're gonna end up getting 70 is equal to sine of 38, sine of 38 degrees times QR. From here to solve for QR, we see we just got to divide each side by the sine of 38 degrees. And when we do that, we're going to be left with 70 over sine of 38 degrees is going to be our answer. So as we can see, that is going to be answer choice B. So B will be our correct answer for number eight. All right, let's go ahead and move on to number nine. So we have some values of X and the corresponding values of F of X are given in the table shown. If there is a linear relationship between X and F of X, which of the following equations gives this relationship? Well, what we can see here is that we go up by one, right, from one to two. We go up by one in our y as we go up by six in our x. So our slope then is gonna be one over six. So we can go ahead and get rid of answer choices A and answer choices B. And if we look at answer choices C, they both have the correct slope. So now we gotta solve for our correct y-intercept. Well, in doing that, we can see that to get to zero as our x, we have to go back by two. So we have to go back by two x. If we're going back by 2x, then we have to go back by negative 2 over 6. Now, when we go back by negative 2 over 6 from 1, that's going to leave us with positive 4 over 6, which we know is going to equal uh, 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 2 over 3. So if we look at our answer choices, we see the correct y-intercept and slope is in equation D. So our answer there will be D for number 9. Moving on to number 10. Got a line is shown in the xy plane, line P not shown as perpendicular to line M. Which of the following could be the equation of line P? All right, well, line P is going to be perpendicular to line M. We see that the slope for line M is going to be down 2 and over 1. So it's going to be negative 2 is the slope of M. Well, the slope of P then is going to be the flipped sign reciprocal. Okay, so slope of P, slope of P has to be then positive 1 half. Well, now that we've got our slope, we see the only answer choice with that slope of positive one half is gonna be answer choice A. So our answer there will be A. So anytime you have a line that's perpendicular to another line, it has to have the reciprocal slope and then the opposite sign as well. All right, let's go to number 11 now. What is the y-intercept of the graph y equals x minus four squared plus three in the xy plane? All right, well, our y-intercept's gonna occur where x is zero, so we can go ahead and plug in a zero for x. We're gonna have zero minus four squared and then plus three, we know zero minus four. It's going to give us negative 4. Negative 4 squared will give us 16. And then 16 plus 3 will give us 19. Therefore, our answer has to be D. Y-intercept occurs where X is 0, and we see our Y-coordinate there is going to be 19. Moving on to number 12. For the given function F, what is the minimum value of F of X? Well, our minimum value of F of X comes at our vertex since this graph is opening upwards. How do we know it's opening upwards like this? Well, we know it's opening upwards because our X squared term is positive. All right, so now that we know that, we can go ahead and factor this and solve for our zeros, and then that's going to help us get to our vertex. So when we go ahead and factor this out, we see that we're going to end up having x plus 2 times x plus 2. Well, that's going to tell us then that our vertex, we know our vertex is going to become, is our vertex will be at the midpoint between our zeros. In this case, since our zero is only 1, and that's at x equals negative 2, we know that our minimum occurs when x is going to equal negative 2. So from here, we can go ahead and plug that into our equation, right? So it's going to be f of negative 2, and that's going to give us our minimum value. Well, negative 2 squared is going to be added to 4 times negative 2, and then also added to 4. And we see then that f of negative 2 
is going to equal positive 4 minus 8 and then plus 4, which will equal 0. So our answer here for the minimum value of f of x will be d, 0. All right, moving on to number 13. Which linear function or which linear equation has exactly one solution? All right, well, if we look at option A, we see that we've got y equals 5 minus y. That's going to have one solution. Now, I'm going to show you how you can get the answer A, even if you didn't recognize that right away. If you look at answer choice B, you have y equals y minus 5. Okay, there's never going to be a solution for that because whatever this right side of y minus 5 is, it's always going to be 5 less than the left side, so they'll never equal each other. Same thing with C. The y plus 5 will always be 5 greater on this right side of our equation than that left side where it's just y, so C will never be true either because there will be no solution for either of these. There'll be no solution and then no solution. And then with option D, there's going to be infinite solutions, infinite solutions, okay, because you have y plus 5 and then also y plus 5. Therefore, there's going to be infinite solutions there, so the only answer choice with one solution by process of elimination has to be A. And another thing with A, if you want proof there's only one solution or that there is a solution, you can see if you put in 2.5 for Y, you'd have 2.5 equals 5 minus 2.5, which would also equal 2.5. All right, but keep in mind that you can really just recognize that A is the correct answer and move on from there. You don't have to take time identifying why B, C, and D are wrong. Once you know A is correct, you can go ahead and move on. That's going to help you save time. But I just wanted to show you that to use it as a teaching moment. All right, now let's go ahead and move on to 14. What is the graph of y equals 4 minus 2 times quantity 0 0.5 to the power of x? All right, the key thing to understand here is that this number in parentheses, and I'm going to zoom in so you can see it better, this number in parentheses here is telling us that we're having every time that we increase x by 1. So every time that we move one unit to the right on our x-axis, we're going to have this value right here. Okay, This value here is going to get split in half. So as we move to the right then on our x-axis, we see that the number we're subtracting from 4 is going to get half as big. Therefore, we're going to approach 4 as we move to the right. So as we move to the right, we are going to move towards 4. Okay, so we're going to move towards this line here. So let's go ahead and take a look for an answer choice that shows that. We see A does not show that, so we can go ahead and get rid of A. If we look at B, we see B also doesn't show us approaching that 4 on the graph as we move to the right on the x-axis, so we can get rid of that. And then we look at C and D. We see that C does, but we see D does not. Therefore, our answer has to be C. All right, moving on to 15. The graph of the given equation in the xy plane is a circle. What's the radius of the circle? All right, well, we know our equation of a circle is going to be x minus h squared plus y minus k squared, where our center, and that's going to equal our radius squared, where our center is h and k, where our center is h and k. All right, so to solve this question, what we have to recognize then is that in order to get this minus 6x, we have to have x minus 3 squared, okay? And then with that x minus 3 squared, what we would end up having in our equation would be a plus 9, okay? Because minus 3 times minus 3 would give us a plus 9. Now, we see that that plus 9 isn't shown in this left side of our, you know, equal sign, okay? It's not on the left side of this equation. Since that plus 9 is not on the left side of the equation, that means that we had to have minus 9 from each side. So we must have taken 9 away from each side. Next thing, we look at our y term. We have a minus 8y. To have a minus 8y, we have to have had a y minus 4 squared. Now in that case, minus 4 times minus 4 would give us a positive 16, which we also see isn't on our left side of our equation. Therefore, we must have subtracted 16 from our left side of the equation and from our right side of the equation to get rid of it. Now when we look at this, we see we must have taken 25 away from each side of our equation. If we took 25 away from our right side of our equation, then we know 25 was our radius squared. And if 25 was our radius squared, then all we got to do is take the square root of each side. And we know that the square root of 25 is going to be 5. Therefore, 5 is our radius. So our answer there is D. All right, moving on to number 16. Okay, what positive value of x satisfies the given equation above? We can see here that we have the absolute value. We can go ahead and subtract 1 from each side, right? And we see that our x is going to equal 4. Okay, so what positive value of x satisfies the given equation above, and that'll be 4. So 16 is really easy. Moving on to number 17. In the triangle RST, angle T measures 40 degrees and angle R measures 20 degrees. What's the measure in degrees of angle S? Well, we know that all of our angles in a circle are going to have to add up to 180. Therefore, we can go ahead and do 180 minus 40 and then minus 20, and that's going to leave us with 120 degrees as our angle S. Therefore, our answer here is going to be 120 degrees. Keep in mind, you don't have to plot degrees in your answer choice. You just put 120. 
All right, moving on to number 18. What value of x satisfies the given equation? In this case, I want to get rid of this denominator here so I can start to isolate my x. So to do that, I'm going to multiply all of this by 2. And when I do that, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my denominator of 2 when I multiply it by 3x over 2. And then I'll have 3x plus 8. And then that's going to equal 26 because 2 times 13 is 26. From here, all I got to do is isolate my x. So I'll go ahead and subtract 8 from each side. That's going to leave me with 18 is equal to 3x. From there, all I got to do is divide each side by 3. 18 over 3, we know, is going to leave us with 6. So our answer for the value of x will be 6. All right, moving on to number 19 now. What value of x satisfies the given equation? All right, in this case, what we're going to have to do to get rid of our square root is we've got to square each side. So to square each side, x minus 7 squared is going to leave us with x squared minus 14x plus 49. Okay, and keep in mind that that's going to be set equal to 14 minus 2x. All right, from here, we want to set this equal to 0. So to set this equal to 0, what we're going to do is add 2x to each side, add 2x to each side, and then we're also going to subtract 14 from each side. All right, so once we do that, we're going to be left with x squared minus 12x and then plus 35, and that's going to be set equal to 0. From here, we can go ahead and factor. So let's go ahead and factor this down. We see that factors of 35 that are going to add to negative 12 are going to be x minus 7 and then x minus 5. Okay, now to solve this, we know that our potential solutions are 7 and 5. Obviously, one has to be wrong because it says what value of x satisfies the given equation, not values. So what we got to do here is just plug in 1. So let's go ahead and plug in 7. All right, when we plug in 7, we're going to have 7 minus 7. That'll equal 0. Put 7 right here. We'd have 14 minus 2 times 7, which would be 14 minus 14. The square root of 0 is also 0. Therefore, we know 7 is going to be our answer here. All right, let's move on to number 20 now. So this will be our last question. We've got 2x plus 7y equals 4, 8x plus 4y equals 12. If xy is, satisfies the given system of equations, what is the value of y? So to solve for y here, we want to get rid of our x. To do that, we're going to multiply our top equation all by 4 to get 8x, and then we'll subtract our bottom equation with 8x. Then we're going to le be left with our y. So we got 4 times 2x, 8x minus 8x gives us 0. Then we've got 4 times 7y, that's going to give us 28y minus 4y, which will leave us with 24y. And then we'll have 4 times 4, which will give us 16. 16 minus 12 is going to leave us with 4. Therefore, we got 24y is equal to 4. We'll divide each side by 24. And then we know that 4 over 24 can be simplified down to 1 over 6. So our answer for number 20 will be 1 over 6. Hopefully this video is helpful. If it was, make sure to like and subscribe. In addition to that, if you're looking for private SAT tutoring, college essay editing, or college essay brainstorming, be sure to check out my website. The link is in the description. In addition to that, if you're gaining value from my content and from my channel, please consider donating. It helps me to be able to continue to put out these videos for free.